Hello, everyone. This is the Vice President of Internet Infidels, Edward Tamesian. And today, for the third time, I'm going to be interviewing the legendary Dr. Robert M. Price. And to begin our first question, I recently did an interview with Dennis R. McDonald where he claims atheists such as Richard Carrier have been misusing his work to support the Christ myth position, to which Richard replied, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he also jokingly asked me if he thinks Richard is going to hire a hitman to kill him. What Whoa. do you think of all this? <laughs> Well, I don't know uh, exactly what he's talking about either. I mean, it may be that uh, there are mythicists that are rep misrepresenting Dennis as a uh, as a mythicist. That would certainly be wrong. But the the general inference that his work uh, is compatible with mythicism and uh, even suggests it, I, I would have to agree with that because uh, Dennis masterfully shows the dependence of various uh, New Testament narratives uh, on uh, Homer and Virgil and, and oh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Euripides and so on. Uh, and I, I think just absolutely convincingly. Uh, and uh, he doesn't conclude that Jesus is a myth, but it would be very, you almost expect that he will. Uh, by mm -hmm. saying that, uh, well, uh, obviously Jesus in the Gospel of John is largely based on Dionysus, and and this and that story of Paul in Acts certainly is based on Euripides the Bacchae, which is oh, yeah, so he's kind of digging eight. himself in a hole, yeah. And so, but now it's possible that there really was a Jesus and a Paul, and that they've just been. Uh, treated to embellishment by reference to these these widely known works. But mm -hmm. I think that, uh, in, in fact, you can go a lot further and show how that, as, as Thomas L. Brody does, that an awful lot of New Testament narrative looks like it's rewritten from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, so much so, in fact, that uh, that's the thing that really pushed me over the edge into mythicism. I thought... Uh, it, it, do you need a historical Jesus to explain the origin of all this? It just yeah. seems like a distillation of of other very widely known religious and moral allegories. Could have been a Jesus, but it's like uh, Occam's razor. Do you need? I mean, if so much mm -hmm. is explained as literary in origin, where's as as uh, Ronald Reagan once said in an old movie. Where's the rest of me? Uh, where, like, what do you like? What was the basis for the historical Jesus? And like I said in a debate uh, with Bart Ehrman once, if you strip away all this miraculous and mythic stuff, but insist there was a historical Jesus, but he wasn't much of a big deal, how do you explain not only the uh, the uh, silence of pagan writers, but the uh, enthusiasm of Christian writers. It's as if some super fan decided that he believed there must have been a historical Superman, but he had, he right. would admit that, okay, nobody can uh, delete Paul Buildings in a single bound, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it's been embellished, but there was a real Superman. When you trim away all the embellishment, the historical Superman was Clark Kent, a mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. What? I mean, if, if that was it, where would you, who would have invented this, uh, this godlike character? Uh, and so what do you need a historical Jesus for? Could have been one. But I, I can see how what Dennis says easily feeds into mythicism. He does not advocate it, though. That's that's clear. OK, yeah. And, you know, it was interesting because we were talking about Papias's crazy account of Judas Iscariot becoming so big that he blasted, you know, on the floor and worms came out of his dick and stuff like that. And I was mm. like, can you explain how this uh, understanding of Papias th through, you know, an oral tradition came about? And he uh, remarked with, well, I don't think Judas Iscariot was a real historical figure. 
And I was like, and I was, and I was kind of like, you know, Dennis, you're kind of digging a hole because it's yeah. like, well, why not Jesus, you know? <laughs> so it's like, yeah. oh, well, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, and it's not as if you can't demonstrate stages of evolution of the Jesus character just as you can with Judas. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All righty. Yeah, thanks for those remarks. All righty. So going into our second question, the guard account in Matthew has the Pharisees having complete understanding of what Jesus meant when he said he would rise from the dead in three days. While according to the Gospels, it seems like the disciples did not know what Jesus was referring to, perhaps simply to the general resurrection or arising at an undisclosed time. It seems plausible that the Jews would not have known what Jesus meant and therefore never would have asked Pilate to station guards, making the guard account historically unreliable. What do you think? And before you answer the question, I kind of want to give some background to people who might not know of the story. So uh, Jesus and uh, the Gospels relates to the apostles at certain uh, times in his life before he was crucified. On the third day, the Son of Man will rise again. And it even says in the Bible, and the apostles did not know what he meant by the rising from the dead on the third day. Um, D.A. Carson tries to get back at this and say, well, you know, it's not the truth that the guard story is unreliable because the apostles understood what he meant. He meant he would actually rise from the dead in three days they just didn't understand how the messiah could be a dying and rising um you know savior but this is refuted by the transfiguration uh, of christ where jesus's dad comes in a big orb like something from final fantasy 10 and says you know this is my beloved son whom i'm well pleased so at least peter ba james and john knew he was the messiah then so that doesn't work and i'm thinking that's right because it's like think about it if the third day had multiple interpretations like oh does he mean a little rising from the third day or is, is the third day symbolic of an undisclosed time you know the pharisees never would have asked Pilate to spend all his resources doing like a switching of guards you know because it's like you know what if the apostles interpret the third day meaning like five months from now like there's no way pilot's gonna have a station of <laughs> how much money that would cost and how much he hates the jews already like he's just gonna he's not gonna tolerate that or whatever so you know i'm, I'm thinking like maybe if the apostles didn't understand the Jews back then didn't understand what he meant. Maybe the, the Pharisees wouldn't have, and you know, therefore they wouldn't have ever stationed the guards and making the guard story unreliable. So what do you think? Oh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it specifically says they did not understand what rising from the dead meant. And as for the uh, other uh, business about they didn't quite get, uh, huh, dying Messiah? Well, that's very clear, especially in Matthew, the gospel that has the uh, the thing with the guards at the tomb, where um, Peter understands it because Jesus says, well, uh, I got to tell you now that uh, the Son of Man must be, be betrayed to the hands of sinners and all that and be spat on and beaten up and crucified. Uh, and Peter says, God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. He had a pretty good idea. And Jesus turns on him and says, you just don't get it. Uh, this is the plan of God. Uh, Dave Carson is a very learned man. Uh, he, he writes good stuff, but here it's the old ap apologetic two-step. Uh, I, I don't know how he can say things like that with a straight gotcha. face, uh, but he's no dummy. I mean, that's why yeah, it's so he is surprising. Smart. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, in fact, it's it's more. Uh, it, it, you're right. It's it's very uh, odd that the gospel writer would show the disciples who are with Jesus every day. They don't have the faintest idea what he means, but his enemies do. Uh, I mean, they. It's very literal. Like we don't want them getting away with the hoax putting it about that he rose from the dead when they're probably going to steal the body. Man, I mean, they had uh, a very clear idea. Now, isn't it interesting that, like, how do they even know it's supposed to happen? 
Well, because also in Matthew, you have the only place where Jesus publicly predicts that he's going to rise. Uh, he, it's uh, another version. There are about three different versions of the sign of Jonah story, where he says, uh, uh, it's a sinful and uh, adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it, uh -huh. Mark says, and this is, uh, except for the sign of Jonah. Huh? Somebody then adds, uh, for as Jonah was assigned to the men of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. What? That's not much clearer. So Matthew says, adds on, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And, and so the, the scribes are present for this. So it works out a little too neatly that Matthew has added that elaboration so that the, the Sanhedrin will know about the claim. They don't in the other Gospels, and there is no guard at the tomb in the other Gospels. So you can see the fictionalizing going on here. Yeah, you know, it would make sense because it's like if you have guards at the tomb, that would, and presumably they would check, that would add extra us to the fact that the body couldn't have been stolen. So I mm -hmm. wonder why, you know, Mark didn't put it in. It's not enough to say, oh, he just wasn't concerned because of his audience. But like, I mean, Mark, the Gospels are apologetic in nature. So it's like you want to give the best evidence that the empty tomb is only empty because Jesus rose. Indeed, that's why they have the angel to mm -hmm. interpret the tomb. So when the Jews come in or anyone comes in and asks, you know, where's the body? Because, you know, like even those people were logical back then when you when Peter yeah. went to the empty tomb he was like oh you know uh did you know where is his body you know he wondered he didn't think oh he rose from the dead only john did according to the bible but uh you know that's why they have the angel there to interpret the tomb so the angel's like hey you know this tomb's only empty because you know jesus ascended out of it so oh you know that you know that's that you know for that argument and um yes thank you very much for that um that information that kind of confirmed what i was thinking and, and you are right awesome thank you very much yeah i know it's interesting and it's funny because um william lane craig, i actually learned about this from william lane craig because he made a blog post about this issue of the guard story and he even he he addressed two of the criticisms the one was that it wasn't mentioned in the other gospels and he says oh well they just didn't feel like writing about it but in the one about the pharisees in the third day that he even admitted like i have to give it plausibility that it might be legendary and he's like it's anyone's guess whether the guard story is reliable or not but he argues well even if the guards weren't there there's still an empty tomb so even he had to admit it so that's when you know the evidence is pretty good against it yeah oh good god how can he sleep at night oh well interesting oh <laughs> going on to our third question if one subscribes to the Christ myth position that Jesus was not a flesh and blood human, but an astral being, so the apostles thought, who talked with people like Peter, John, and Paul, why was he later morphed into a historical character who was crucified and buried on earth? Well, uh, two things there. I think uh, that... Um there was an earlier stage that's attested kind of between the lines, but it's there in all the gospels, implying that some early Christians thought that Jesus had escaped death as the heroes of certain contemporary novels did, who were actually crucified or condemned to be crucified, but by some trick or another of providence, they, they managed to get out of it. Uh, it is, and, and then the dying and rising God myths. Uh, it seems to me that if you started with the idea that Jesus uh, evaded the reaper uh, under the influence <laughs> of these other religions, uh, you might begin to harden it into him actually dying and coming back. And like the Gospel of Luke is right between these two. Jesus appears to the disciples, and uh, it says they thought they were seeing a spirit. And he says, no, no, touch me and see. It is I myself. No spirit has flesh and bones, as you see, that I have. What is he trying to tell them? That, yeah, yeah I died, but I came back. 
no, I don't think so. He's saying, no, I'm not a ghost. Like that, that would be coming back from the dead. No, it's still me. I'm still here. That's just what happens in the very similar story of Apollonius of Tyana. His disciples are gathered. They think that the emperor Domitian had him killed, but no, he vanished from the courtroom and teleported across the Mediterranean. Uh, the disciples are all mourning. They figure he's got to be dead. And he, he shows up. What? Uh, and he says, look, look, I'm not a ghost come up from Persephone's realm. Touch me and see. It's the same thing thing and the point is explicitly he didn't die he escaped <laughs> death and so is that what they meant but it's not hard to see why Jesus got historicized uh, the slightly bigger question uh, why move from him being an angel or a theophany or something to being a, a, a human founder well I think um, uh, what's his name I losing my uh wrote the oh i got the book right over there uh, i see uh arthur Dreffs, i think you pronounce it or drews it looks like uh he uh solved this one long ago he said you can mm -hmm. tell in the second century that gnostics and and others are debating over whose revelations should be listened to, because you can read them for yourself, all these Gnostic revelations. Jesus appears as a spirit for years after the, the, the so-called crucifixion and tells them other stuff. Well, St. Irenaeus, in a really funny passage, mocks the Gnostics and saying, you guys are really playing a game of can you top this? I mean, one guy has a revelation about this and somebody else says, oh, no, mine supersedes yours. He said, we don't have to worry about that. We are our disciples of the disciples of Jesus who were with him when he was around in the flesh teaching all this stuff. We don't base what we're saying over these subjective visions, hallucinations probably, no, we got it right from the horse's mouth. So it was a question of credentials. You could point to this guy, so you claimed, uh, and say, hey, our founder, he's the one that said this. I don't care what pipe dreams you have. And uh, I think that uh, is a perfectly adequate explanation. Okay, yeah. So you're saying the reason it was morphed into a historical character is because um, people wanted to say, hey, um, we have the right information regarding him. And like, if you don't believe in our version, like you're going to hell, kind of like a thing. So you better listen to, to us. Is that kind of like Yeah, we've arguing? got the real thing. We got the copyright okay. because Jesus existed and lived and taught our founders. Uh, but mm -hmm. you guys, you're with your Jesus visions and all this. Hey, get out of here. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because it's like, it would make sense to kind of morph him into a human because it's like, well, you know, it, you know, you're going to hell if you don't believe in us. And the only way he, uh, you can get out of hell is if he died. And uh, insofar as, you know, his death, we have all the right information about it. So mm -hmm. you got to get everything from us because we have all the right doctrine, you know, exactly. whatever. They're yeah. kind of like the first really fundamentalist, like you got to exactly. believe in all the essentials and got to get mm -hmm. it from us. So, yep. okay, yeah, very interesting view. Thank you for that. All right. Okay, going into our fourth question. Please explain 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, and I'll read it. Um, we do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And my question is, how would they... How would a Christ myth theorist explain this verse in light of the fact that Paul supposedly believed that Jesus was an astral angel? And before you answer, I think Richard Carrier said something about uh, interpreting the last part of the passage as like archons of the aeon. And that mm -hmm. may that, that might mean something about like uh, it might give evidence to the people who crucified Jesus. This actually occurred in the astral realm. And perhaps mm -hmm. I think he says something like devils were crucifying him or all the crucifixion actually happened in the supernatural realm. But yeah, so my question is, how would a Christ myth theorist explain this in light of Paul and the apostles belief that Christ 
was an angel, you know, from the national realm and wasn't crucified on earth. Well, actually, that would be the basis of that theory that, uh, wait a minute, the archons, and these were technical terms in Gnosticism, uh, that uh, they were the, running the uh, the show, the archangels uh, who were fallen, and uh, the, the ultimate God was not even the creator. Well, uh, they said that when um, one of the the ions, one of the emanations from the Godhead, decided to come to Earth to redeem those Gnostic elites who had a spark of the divine in them, uh, that he had to, that it was a secret mission. And they, they believed there were seven different heavens and that uh, beings existed in each one, but they had different types of bodies and so on. He said, as, as the savior, descended from one to the next he assumed the form uh, of the bodily form of all those on that level and the lowest one was our level of flesh and blood existence so uh, he did um uh take on human flesh or the semblance of it it wouldn't really matter it was the, mm -hmm. the so he wouldn't be recognized and then it's odd that in a couple of places in the pauline epistles it says uh he uh, he uh was in the likeness of human flesh uh what what uh, not just in human flesh as the later theologians would say and so this is actually one of the cornerstones uh, of the Christ myth theory. It doesn't say anything about the Sanhedrin or Pontius Pilate putting him to death. The archons uh, are, now that could refer to human leaders. You, you yeah. could well imagine, well, uh, what he means is that Pilate and Caiaphas and all these guys were unwitting dupes of these uh, these archangels behind the throne. Uh, yeah, there were probably people that believed that, but interestingly, it doesn't say that. In Colossians, it says also that the principalities and powers, there's another name for the same thing, they were the ones that put him on the cross, uh, not knowing that he would use his death to destroy the law that they had promulgated. Uh, and uh, to direct worship to them and not God, because uh, God was higher and above that. Uh, so the, actually that is, those passages are uh, very important for the interpretation that Paul did not believe in a historical uh, crucifixion. Now there's another Pauline passage which does imply it in 1 Thessalonians. He says, the Jews put to death our Lord. Uh, but then you get into this wretchedly complicated mess as to what did Paul actually write. And, and I think there are pretty <laughs> darn good reasons for thinking he did not write First and Second Thessalonians, as been, has been long um, argued. But I'm the first to admit that this gets into a real swamp. It's really difficult to find well, firm <laughs> ground. But it does strike me as odd that First Corinthians and Colossians seem to be saying that these spiritual uh, demonic entities were the ones that put him to death. And then when you think of the book of Revelation, that he was crucified before the foundation of the world, and that he appears dead and resurrected on the heavenly throne already as the seven-eyed lamb whose head is 180 degrees back, because meaning he's been sacrificed. Oh, like mm -hmm. it's in heaven. Uh, what what is going on here? It, there, it seems to me <laughs> we can never know. But it seems to me an attractive strong hypothesis that uh, that some early Christians believed in a heavenly sacrifice. Gotcha. Interesting. All righty. Going into our fifth question. We kind of talked about this in our last interview, uh, but I think there should be more elaboration on this as well because it's very interesting. So Mark chapter 4 Verse 11 through 12 reads, But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he, this being Jesus, said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that 
and I believe this is a quote of Isaiah, seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. So it looks like Jesus is saying he doesn't want some people to be saved. <laughs> Care to explain? Uh, yeah, I tend to think that that uh, represents a Gnostic current in Mark. I mean, you got all this stuff about the Messianic secret anyway. Like, why doesn't he want people to know? Uh, and specifically, like, it seems to presuppose that he has an exoteric, a public teaching uh, that... Uh, which would uh, fit with what most scholars say today. Oh, yeah, he's talking about the kingdom of God being given to the poor and the, uh, the ignorant uh, and the intelligent. They, they think they're too good for it and all that. Uh, well, in, in other words, it implies people did not walk away from Jesus preaching saying, what the hell was that about? Like, what did he say? Blessed of the cheesemakers? What? Uh, and no, it, they, they apparently liked what they heard because Mark uh, has the people coming in huge droves to hear Jesus. But there's a secret meaning that only the, the inner circle get. And it seems to me that the best candidate for that is realized eschatology. What, what you have is straightforward forwardly in the gospel of John and in the gospel of Thomas and even in Luke where like the disciples uh, say that well in Luke uh, uh, how will we know when the kingdom of God will come uh, and he says look it's not coming with signs to be checked off oh boy it's got to be soon now uh, nor will they say oh here it is there it is no the kingdom of God is within you or in the Gospel of Thomas, when will the the uh, the re, the uh, repose of the dead come? And he says, "What you expect has already happened. You just don't recognize it." And of course, this mm -hmm. in, in terms of history of religions, this is the same kind of thing that happens when any religion sets a date for the coming of of the end. It oh, doesn't yeah. happen, and they have to say to do some fast thinking and they say okay uh it did happen we just uh didn't quite understand what the it was like the jehovah's witness terrible embarrassment and so they said well uh, he did come but not to earth he's like orbiting the earth and reigning from there or the adventists mm -hmm. the same thing and it's what are you gonna do it, it's just cognitive dissonance reduction yeah. and so they say well if you have eyes to see it the world did change i, I was thinking about christmas songs that uh, uh joy to the earth the savior reigns uh let men their songs employ um, and let the, the nations prove his righteousness and all that. And I remember thinking, what happened? How did I miss that? You know, what Boy. <laughs> this world is now run by the Savior and all that. It just happens to look exactly as it did beforehand. Uh, and, but they have to say, well, yes, yes, but that's just because you're unregenerate. You don't see it like we do. And, and eventually they say, well, okay, I guess we were kind of jumping the gun. But I think that's the mystery of the kingdom of God. Don't tell anybody, but it's here already. Uh, yeah. And uh, at least that's not reading some modern thing into it. I mean, that's that's what happens in such situations. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah, and it's definitely not really apparent because um, uh, just to give a little short background, my paper deals with how Adam and Eve were able to sin. And to make a long story short, I proved conclusively that he had to create Adam and Eve with an ingrained disposition to sin. So it's it, it makes uh you know God kind of more at fault than we thought. It's not just merely a matter of free will. And I also prove mm -hmm. how if if the God of uh, utter divine determinism exists, like he does in Calvinism and or Islam, he would have to be the efficient cause of sin. And uh, yeah. yeah, this work 
Yeah, it's 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 interesting. And uh, I talked with people about this. They're like, all your research, I mean, all your uh, statements and research research looks good. John W. Loftus posted about it. And I talked uh-huh. with William Lane Craig in our interview about it. With We did an interview with uh, me and him in like December. And he, you know, he acknowledged the paper and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it it's legit. So it's like, you know, it's interesting because it's kind of detrimental to this religious idea of like, you know, mm-hmm. if God wants everyone to get into heaven and, you know, not sin, why is he creating people with an impulse to sin or even causing them to sin. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they'll comment there. <laughs> yeah, Hosea Ballou, uh, a self-educated, uh, circuit-riding, universalist preacher in the 1800s, uh, mm-hmm. he used to outrage the congregation with shocking controversial titles, which he would back up. And one sermon was, God, the author of sin. And oh. uh, I, I don't happen to what you said it must be written somewhere but i just love that kind of thing the old zen slap uh, waking and this, up. this was a universalist yeah because he believed everybody was going to heaven thanks to the great it, it, the idea was hey you know jesus died to save the whole human race and what do you know it worked uh, he didn't just sort of invent the means like Jonah saw with the vaccine. No, he saved the world. That means nobody's going to hell. Well, uh, yeah, I guess fascinating. Yeah, but it like, works both ways. He determines people to do good, but he determines people to do evil. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, yeah then like, you're doing, dealing with just a, a, a show, a, a charade. Yeah. And like, we know with like the fundamentalist, the fundamentalist preachers and stuff like that, or conservatives like Craig, you got to be careful. Like you only got to tell them the parts they want to hear. Like when I talked about my scholarly paper, he was like, oh, this is very impressive. I was like, I mentioned you in it too. He's like, oh, thanks a lot. And I was like, I mentioned that, you know, the God of Calvinism would make God the efficient cause of sin. I didn't say anything about if libertarian freedom was the truth because he likes to bash against Calvinists like most Molinists. So I only mentioned that part to him about the Calvinist guy <laughs> being the author. He was like, oh, yeah, I agree with your assessment about, you know, the greats are determining the will and he creates people's desires. Mm. So I only told him that part about it, which he agreed with. I didn't tell him the other stuff. So I ended up, I, I'm sneaky. I know how, I know how to <laughs> press people's buttons and, and get what, what you want out of them. So, mm-hmm. Oh, well, it worked. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah, I mean, I told them the truth, just not the rest of it. So, all righty. <laughs> all righty. Lastly, Justin Martyr in his first apology, written in about 155 AD, writes, and saying that the word, who is the first offspring of God, was born for us without sexual union as Jesus Christ, our teacher, and that he was crucified and died, and after rising again, ascended into heaven, we introduce nothing new beyond what you say of those whom you call the sons of Zeus. And throughout his work, he makes some parallels, like interesting parallels between the pagan gods and Jesus. And then, but he also remarks, and I'm par- like paraphrasing a point here, he makes the claim that in order to explain the strong resemblances of Christ's life to those of the pagan sons of God, he insists that devils, knowing what was to become of the son of God on earth in the future, wrote down the details of what was to become of him in various pagan myths, though with some inaccuracies. Um, how would you respond to this? Well, it's, it's theoretic. I mean, it's a coherent notion. But it's ludicrous nonetheless. Uh, and in fact, yeah. how did the demons know? Well, because they uh, they not only knew what the prophets said, but like uh, Justin is naively assuming that they just said, oh, you know, Jesus is coming and he's going to die and this and that and the other thing, which they could only squeeze out of the Bible, Christians, by, uh, you know, allegorical and other uh, interpretations. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, it seems unlikely that that uh, the devil would would know the Christian hermeneutic to apply. But let's you know, really did the, the absurdity of this is. Uh, well, it, for one thing, it makes you wonder what point is he trying to make? He, I think the point is kind of like what uh, Paul says to the Sanhedrin in Acts. Why should it be, or maybe it's to the Epicureans and Stoics in Acts 17, I forget. Why should it be considered impossible among you for the dead to rise? It, it's like that's the linchpin 
you're just incredulous. What is wrong with that? I mean, if you got an almighty God, couldn't he do it? Well, that may be the point. Like this, these notions we talk about uh, should be nothing strange to you. I mean, how, how, how can you ridicule them? You have very similar beliefs. Okay, that I can see, but here's the real problem. Uh, that he's reduced apparently to saying, this time it really happened. And, and of course, we would say, why should they have believed that? I mean, what can you uh, offer to say that this is the real one? I always love to make the analogy with comic books. It, again, our Superman fanatic, uh, if he said, yeah, uh, I'm telling you, there was a historical Jesus. And somebody says, well, how about, how about Captain Marvel and the Martian Manhunter and the Green Lantern? They're very similar. You're saying all of those existed too. Oh, no, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're just made up. Well, why, why should we think Superman is any different? Uh, is, is there any conceivable reason? So there's a huge problem there. But one thing I cannot believe that apologists like Craig don't seem to see is they like to argue that, um, uh, I, I use a very different argument, that uh, there weren't any pre-Christian dying and rising god myths or religions and mm -hmm. that the the mystery religions okay they had initiation, initiation rites, right. but uh, they right. didn't have dying and rising saviors until they <laughs> borrowed them from christianity they're all post-christian edwin yamuchi says that a whole bunch of these guys how can you say that i mean as mm -hmm. we have early sources, texts that are datable, where they do definitely have Baal and Hercules and Attis dying and rising. But even if we didn't, imagine Justin and Tertullian and others arguing that uh, in, in this fashion, I mean, their, their whole argument is admitting that, of course, the stuff we say about Jesus is nothing new. You, yeah, sure yeah, your yeah. ancestors they would never argue that if everybody knew pagans dying and rising god beliefs were younger than christianity and borrowed from it how can you miss that yeah but true. they do it's, it's cool. just incredible yeah yeah justin never says hey uh we came up with it first and then you pagans came up with it later in the you know, I guess the early second century, you know, he says that the pagan beliefs were earlier. And you brought up an excellent point about the devil's uh, like recognition back in Old Testament times, because think about it. Even people like Moses, according to the Bible, you know, an inspired prophet, he didn't think that the Messiah was going to be the second person of the Godhead and be a sinless person who would die for the sins of the world. Like maybe they thought like Yahweh was going to give, you know, a once and for all everlasting propitiation, but not through like a sinless son of God, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they, and like, so considering that, if an inspired prophet was left out on those details, because they thought the Messiah was going to be a sinner, you know, but who was saved, maybe like David, you know, and he was going to be God. So uh, considering that, like, if the inspired prophets are kind of, you know, not knowing exactly what Christ was going to be like, how much less the devils? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it's so absurd. And in fact, there's another thing that doesn't get brought into these conversations is the fact that in most of the Old Testament, there is no Christian type view of salvation. There's like a mm -hmm. handful of people that go to heaven because they don't die. People are not dying and going to heaven. You got Elijah, possibly Moses, Enoch. They went to heaven because they were taken up alive. Everybody else either just died, like in the, at the end of the Garden of Eden story, or, or they uh, went to Sheol, which was just a place that God never even thought of and that everybody was stumbling around uh, in, in the darkness. Th this, there's yeah. no idea of going to heaven until way late in the day, like the second century BCE. So to talk mm -hmm. about, oh, how were they going to get saved that they didn't have any such notion they're just yeah they're you're just right. reading the old testament as if it were the new yeah yeah even barker brought that up i was like uh 
I asked him about like some Old Testament character like David when he committed adultery. I was just talking to him, like, oh, do you think <laughs> like uh, David was saved throughout this ordeal? And he was like, I don't think there was a such thing as being saved back in those days. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Very, very interesting. All righty. Well, that's all the questions I had for you. Thanks a lot. And I think this was one of our uh, better uh, talks. We really got into some good questions here. I almost want to cry. It's like a it's like uh, it's going to be like watching a good Casablanca film. It's just solid. It's kind of like my first carrier interview. Just really good questions, really good delivery. And I think both mythicists and uh, historicists are going to appreciate this. Um, you know, going into the exact details of like, you know, the arguments for and against mythicism and stuff like that. Mm. All righty. Well, thanks a lot, Dr. Robert M. Price. Okay. And uh, before we close off. Yeah, thank you. And before we close off, do you have any final thoughts, promotions, books? Uh, well, I've had a, a few books come out recently. One of them is Judaizing Jesus about how yeah, the latest effort by uh, mainstream New Testament critics is to to um, recast Jesus in as Jewish uh, mainstream rabbinic Jewish framework as they can because my I argue if they're just trying to come up with a usable Jesus for ecumenical dialogue which I think is a great thing I love interfaith dialogue but it seems to me they're kind of cheating and I, I try to explain that I got another one that came out about the same time called when gospels collide uh, where mm -hmm. I go where I try to show that I am the apologist and champion of the Bible by taking mm -hmm. all of these contradictions between the gospels and saying did they disagree because the authors were a bunch of stupid buffoons who couldn't keep the score? No, they're skilled writers who made changes to, to make different points. Don't sell it short by all this harmonizing nonsense. Because yeah, that's my big deal as the Bible geek. I, I love the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible anymore, but I love it like a classicist loves the Iliad and the Odyssey. And yeah. I, I want to promote understanding. And I don't care if anybody who is interested is a believer or an unbeliever. It doesn't matter to me. I'm just interested in the subject matter. So I'm trying to get that across. Uh, I've been interviewed quite a bit lately and therefore have had less time to spend on doing my own Bible geek, but I'm going to try to do some more of those uh, pretty quickly. So awesome. I have awesome. Sounds good. All righty. Thank you very much. And you and your wife have a good day. Oh, you too. Thanks. Hey, yeah.